Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Welcome back to this special two-part launch episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. Bart and I are going to be continuing our conversation about his best-selling book, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. This episode, we're looking less at Bart's personal journey through faith and academia and more at the actual scholarly issues at play here, namely who changed the texts of the books of the New Testament and why did they do it? Uh, before we get into that, Bart, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, not bad. I'm at my, uh, I've got this uh, mountain house in Western North Carolina that I retreat to to write and think. So I'm spending my days writing and thinking. How, how good can I get? <laughs> I was going to say that sounds absolutely perfect. Yeah. So, uh, and Megan, uh, so uh, last time you announced that you're an Assyriologist <laughs> who studies ancient things about Assyria. Like, do you just like tell us what languages do you have to do? Uh, yeah, so for my graduate studies, I did, um, I minored in Biblical Hebrew, and my uh, main language requirements were Sumerian and Akkadian. Sumerian and Akkadian, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, Lots let's of not fun. talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to say. <laughs> well, it's been a while since I, I really looked at them seriously, so I'm not sure I'd have an awful lot to say either. <laughs> okay. Right. All right, okay, good. Um, so... But can you maybe just take a couple of minutes and explain to us why this is an important topic? Uh, yeah, well, it's important for uh, a couple of reasons. For for people of faith, um, uh, Christian faith, it's obviously important to know what the Bible says. And this entire study of uh, that scholars call textual criticism, which is trying to reconstruct what the original texts said, uh, what the authors actually wrote, uh, this whole discipline is tried is designed in order to show wh what the authors wrote uh, on the assumption that you know if people want to know what the Bible says, you got to got to know what the words are, and you you can't know what the Bible means if you don't know what it says. And so it's a it's a very fundamental, basic, uh, and and the oldest it's the oldest discipline in biblical studies. Uh, biblical studies is a very complicated set of uh, disciplines, but. Um, the, the, trying to figure out what the words were was virtually the first thing that came along once they started, once they invented printing in the, in the 15th century, they had to know which words to print. <laughs> and uh, since different manuscripts had different wordings, they had to make decisions. And so that, so for people of faith who want to know what the Bible says, obviously it's important to, to know the words, but, you know, even for people who aren't people of faith, uh, um, anytime you're reading an author, you want to know, what the author actually wrote. You don't know what you don't. You're not interested in the mistakes that a, a public a printer made, you know, mm. or uh, or a copy editor or something. You want to know what the author said, and so that's why textual criticism is actually used. It's not. It's not unique to uh, the New Testament or the Old Testament. Every book from the ancient world um, has scholars who study it to try and figure out what the words originally were, and not just the ancient world, but up into modern times, I'm up to 19th century authors. <laughs> they, you, you have textual critics trying to figure out what the, the author actually wrote. Fantastic, and you, you've kind of explained it as you're talking, but what is textual criticism exactly? So people get it confused because uh, I, I get a lot of emails from people saying, you know, well, you know, textual criticism, this, that, or the other, and they, they think it means something like uh, interpreting texts. Uh, and that when you read a text, if you're like a historian, you apply textual criticism instead of just kind of using common sense or something. And it, it's not that. Uh, textual criticism is not about interpretation uh, or about understanding a text. It's not about criticizing a text. It's not about trying to figure out what historically happened behind the text. It's none of those things. It's a technical term referring to trying to establish what the text originally said and how it got changed. Uh, and so with the New Testament, it's trying to figure out when you're studying the Gospel of Luke, it's not trying to understand what it means. It's trying to figure out what what the what the early what the oldest form of the words are, hopefully the words that the author wrote. Thank you. And uh, when you've got as many manuscripts as we have for the New Testament, that is quite the challenge. Uh, well, it is because. Um, you know, the, we have we have so many manuscripts of the New Testament. We have far more manuscripts than for any other book in the ancient world. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, it's not surprising that we do because <laughs> our books mainly through, from antiquity have been preserved to us through the Middle Ages. And who was copying books in the Middle Ages in the West? Well, it was monks and monasteries. And so if, given the choice of copying the, uh, the letters of Paul or the plays of Plautus, <laughs> you know, what, what, which are they more likely to copy? Well, okay, so they make a lot of copies of Paul, uh, not to make copies of Plautus. But that, what that means is since you've got so many copies out there, we've got over 5,700 complete or small fragments of the New Testament, given that number, then you're going to have a lot of differences uh, because scribes make changes. And so uh, with that many differences, you've got to figure out, you know, it's a little bit harder than if you have only two differences and you have to decide. If you've got hundreds of differences or thousands, that, that complicates things. Thank you. So um, one of the maybe the, the byproducts of having so many copies of these manuscripts is that each time a manuscript is copied, uh, there is a an opportunity for uh, additions to be made or mistakes to be made or things to be taken away um, from the texts. What kinds of changes do we most commonly see in the New Testament manuscripts? Yeah, um, it's actually a fairly easy question to answer because, you know, there, there there's kind of a limited number of things you could look for. And scholars typically, in a very broad sense, differentiate between what are almost certainly just accidental slips of the pen, accidental mistakes, and what look like they're probably made intentionally. Uh, like if you have an entire story that is added in some manuscripts and missing from other manuscripts, somebody's either taking it in or putting it, you know, taking it out or putting it in. And so probably, and there are some changes that they certainly look like they're intentional. So these accidental changes are the ones that are usually the easiest to uh, find. And they're by far the most numerous, probably the most numerous uh, changes in our manuscripts are just misspelled words. <laughs> I mean, and, and, you know, scribes can be forgiven of this because, you know, they, they didn't have dictionaries, let alone spell check. <laughs> I mean, my students, you know, my, my students turn in a paper with misspellings. I just don't get it because, you know, the computer puts a red line under it. <laughs> it's not that hard <laughs> to figure out. Whereas, you know, these scribes, they, they didn't, mo that, sometimes they didn't care how it was spelled. You know, you, you'll get a word like you get the same word within two or three lines, and sometimes it'll be spelled differently two or three times. <laughs> there you go. And so, so those are all they, they all count, right? They're all they're all changes, and so that kind of change happens. Uh, accidental changes happen a lot. Thank you. And is this? Um, do we see a change throughout time in what kinds of mistakes are made with manuscripts? I understand that the earliest scribes were not professionals. Yeah, so I think it's a little bit hard for people to get their mind around. But when you when you're thinking about the early books of the the books of the New Testament, you know, and you have someone like um, you, you say you've got uh, somebody who writes the Gospel of Matthew, and whoever it is, you know, we call him Matthew. We're not sure what his name was. But he he, write, he writes his account of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Long book for for us. It's in twenty eight chapters. They, they didn't use chapters and verses, but it's but it, it's a long book. So he writes this thing, and um, he probably writes it for his own church community, so that they'll have a written account of Jesus' words and and deeds. And so he does that. Um, uh, but then you know, if somebody else wants a copy, how do you get a copy? <laughs> well. Uh, you know, there's no, you know, they don't have photocopy machines. You got, you got to make the copy, and the only way to get a copy is for somebody to copy it by hand. The author might make two copies, or he might have a secretary makes a second copy, or it may be that somebody from a local church comes in and sees they've got a written account of Jesus' life. They go, Whoa, we want that, and so they make a copy. But uh, the earliest Christians making copies just happened to be the people who were literate in the congregation. Uh, the Christian communities were small. They were famously uh, populated mainly by people without educations. Um, and so uh, if you have somebody in your church who can read and write, that's that's the guy who does it. Uh, it's only centuries later that you start getting something like professional scribes who actually are trained to do the job. And naturally, a professional scribe will do a better job than uh, than somebody who just happens to be literate. Uh, and so it, do, it does change over time. Do the professional scribes make different kinds of errors or changes to the manuscripts? Well, they tend to make fewer accidental mistakes, although not always. We have we have uh, some manuscripts that have, that were 
done by what we would call professionals. I mean, technically, I guess a professional would be somebody who gets paid for the job. Uh, but I would consider monks and monasteries. They're not actually, you know, mm -hmm. they're not getting an hourly wage, but I would, they're trained to, to do this kind of work. Uh, and so people who are trained tend to make fewer uh, accidental mistakes. And as time goes on, um, they start having a different view of the, by what they're copying. The earliest copyists, whoever was copying, you know, so Matthew makes his gospel and somebody copies it because they wanted an account. They're not thinking, oh, this is the Bible. They, they don't have a sense that this, they're copying God's word now. They just, they've got a written account of Jesus' life. That's great. Mm -hmm. And so, but later on, when you start thinking, this is the Bible, this is, this is inspired by God, then you take a little bit more care uh, when you're that, when you're copying, so you're less likely to change it. On the other hand, since a lot of these uh, later copyists, um, for example, were monks uh, or or Christians who were highly trained but were literate and uh, intelligent and probably theologically educated, they tended to make changes that would be more theologically important. In other words, if the text is saying something that they think that could be really misread. You know, or somebody might misunderstand that if they don't, they, they'll clarify it by rewording it, you know, or sometimes they'll say, you know, uh, this looks like, boy, a heretic could use this one. And they'll uh, they'll change it in order to make it clear. Actually, it's not saying what this heretic might want it to say. And so they, they, they put it in other words. Mm -hmm. And so that tends to happen when you've got more educated, high, highly theologically trained scribes. Does that then mean that we have... Um different manuscripts may be espousing different theologies based on who has been copying them. Yeah, um, you know, I wondered about that for a long time. I, my, the first um, kind of serious big book that I wrote for a, like a serious scholarly audience, uh, I, my first couple of books were, for, were very technical books for the six people in my field of expertise <laughs> who cared about. And it was they, so I have a couple of books that are really technical on this kind of thing. But then once I wrote a book for kind of a broader audience, my, it wasn't it wasn't for like a you know Barnes and Noble crowd, but it's for like scholars in New mm -hmm. Testament and early Christianity and related fields who might be interested in this kind of thing. My book was called The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. And what I did was I tried to isolate every instance I could in our surviving manuscripts of places where it looked like the text had been changed in order to uh, incorporate the scribe's understanding of who Christ was. You know, is Christ, is he, is he really God? If he's God, is he really human? If he's God and human, is he two things or is he one thing or what? There, there are all these disputes in early Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to find every instance where where looks looks like these were intentional changes. It looks like they are that that certainly affect the understanding of Christ. So I went through the entire Bible and found all these. I looked for manuscripts that had one leaning or another. Like, is there is this manuscript done by somebody who believes that Jesus is so much God that he's not really human, and so they change it, or is this manuscript done by a scribe who thinks Jesus is fully human and he wasn't really God in the sense that they like he's always God. And so they have these different views, but we don't have manuscripts that line up that way. Mm -hmm. What what we have, so we don't have manuscripts that are definitely this theological persuasion or that theological persuasion. What we have are textual changes that are made at various times in various places by various scribes that happen to be surviving in our surviving manuscripts. So there may have been at one time, and and the early church fathers say that there were at one time manuscripts that were done by by scribes of a certain theological persuasion, where they just like made a radical change throughout the manuscript. We don't have none of those manuscripts survive, probably because later Christians didn't want to copy heretical manuscripts. <laughs> Do those changes then make it into the New Testament as we have it, as is currently read in churches? Oh, definitely. Yeah, lots of these changes do. And there there are some of these changes that it's clear uh, somebody's changed the text and it's not clear which way the change went. <laughs> because, oh, interesting. You have, you have two forms of the text, right? You have a verse that's saying one thing or verses saying a different thing. So somebody's changed it and they could be ra mean radically different things. And, uh, and the Bibles will print one of those. Obviously, they don't print both of them. And so um, 
I'll, I'll just give you, I'll give you an example. Can I give you an example? Please, please. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite examples. It was uh, the subject of one of the first articles I ever wrote. Um, people are used to this phrase, uh, sweating blood. <laughs> oh boy, sweating blood. Uh, where does that come from? It comes from uh, Luke chapter 22, <laughs> as it turns out. In, in Luke chapter 22, you have the account of Jesus going to the garden, uh, to garden to pray right after the Last Supper and before he's arrested where he goes and asks God to remove this cup from him because he doesn't, he doesn't want to go through with it if he doesn't have to. And, and um, in, uh, in some manuscripts, what it says is that Jesus uh, went into deep agony and he starts sweating and his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground and an angel came and comforted him. Uh, so that's Luke chapter 22, verses 43 and 44. Um, you'll find it in most Bibles. There are a number of manuscripts, including our oldest and best manuscripts, that don't have those verses about Jesus sweating blood and an angel comforting him. And so scholars have to decide, did somebody add those verses to an account that did not have them? Or did a scribe take away those verses, delete them from an account that did have them? This is a running debate among scholars. And it's, it's never been satisfactorily resolved in the sense that everybody agrees. Although everybody who takes a stand on this thinks that it has been satisfactorily resolved <laughs> to their view. And yeah. I'm one of those. <laughs> and so uh, this article I wrote, uh, it, I, wrote in I wrote in graduate school. It's one of the first things I wrote, but it got published in a journal. And, and it shows up again. I expanded in my book, Orthodox Corruption Scripture. I argue what happened is that uh, the oldest and best manuscripts don't have these verses. They're at odds with other parts of the Gospel of Luke. They don't fit in the context very well. I argue for a lot of reasons that the verses were not original and that the person who added them wanted to add them in order to show that Jesus was fully human. He's sweating blood. Mm -hmm. He's really upset. And so it's trying to promote the humanity of Jesus against people who are saying that he was so divine, he didn't really suffer much. That's really interesting. Thank you. And for people who are want to know more about this, we will get into it. We're planning episodes on, on all of the Gospels individually. So yes, we yes. will revisit that um, at a later date. When you have this kind of debate, how do you go about trying to determine the original meaning? Do you just go with the oldest manuscript? Do you go with um, the majority view? What yeah. kinds of things play into that argument? Yeah, so you know, you're trying to decide were these verses in there or not, and you know, there's no question that somebody changed the manuscript. Yeah, so people say, well, how do you know people changed the manuscript? You're just saying they're changing manuscripts. Well, you're just making that up. I'm not making it up. You got two manuscripts. <laughs> some have it, some don't. Some was, you know, you know, so you got to so you got to explain it. Something's happened here, and so, um, so. I'm, I'm going to take a minute to explain this because it, it's a little bit, um, it's kind of a lengthy thing. It's <laughs> So what scholars do is they, they, people who are experts in this field divide the kinds of evidence that they look at into what they call external evidence and internal evidence. Um, uh, so the external evidence is what, what kinds of manuscripts support having the verses and which ones support not having the verses. And when you're looking at what kinds of manuscripts, you've got all sorts of questions in mind. For example, you might want to know how many, you know, how many manuscripts have one reading, but not another reading. Um, and so, for example, you might, you might think off the top of your head, yeah, well, majority rules, right? <laughs> I mean, suppose you've got, you suppose you've got a, uh, you've got 600 manuscripts that have the verses and five manuscripts that don't have the manuscripts, don't have the verses. Well, you say 600 to five, that's a, that's a no-brainer, right? Except it's not. And the reason it's not is this. Suppose the original, suppose Luke wrote his thing and there were two copyists of, the, of Luke's original. Okay, so you've got the original and then you've got scribe A and scribe B and they both make a copy, okay? One of them, and the two copies differ about whether those verses are in. So <laughs> one of them added it and the other, or one, either one of them added it or one of them took it away, okay? So you've got copy A, copy B, and okay. Suppose copy A is copied by 30 scribes and copy B gets destroyed in a fire before anybody just copies it. Mm. Then you've got one of the readings in 30 manuscripts 
and the other in none. So it's 30 to zero, right? Yeah, but that's not, you know, uh, you can't just count because it's not 30 to zero, it's one to one, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so you can't, so scribes have known for centuries, you can't just count the manuscripts. So they look at other things. They look, how old are the manuscripts? If you've got, if these five manuscripts that have it are from the third and fourth centuries, and the and the however many I said six hundred I forget what I said however many <laughs> do have it are six hundred have it but they're like from the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries like they're a thousand years later mm -hmm. well that should, that does matter <laughs> and so you look at the you you might want to look a little bit at the number but you have to think about the number but you look at the age of the manuscript you look about whether one reading is found in only one locality oh this is found only in manuscripts copied in Italy, whereas this other one's found everywhere in the Christian world. And you look at some manuscripts are better than others. I mean, there are places where it's obvious. This manuscript's made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, if you get a reading that's found in manuscripts that make a lot of mistakes generally, and you've got another reading that's found in manuscripts generally, don't make many, well, that tips the balance. Okay, so I'm going to stop with that. That's just the external evidence. <laughs> uh, now, would you like me to talk about the internal? I would, I would. <laughs> because this is where it actually gets a little more interesting for me and for a lot of people, is you not only look to see which manuscripts uh, have these things, you also look uh, to see, you look to see which reading makes the best sense on internal grounds. So external evidence is what, what witnesses, what manuscripts have. Internal mm -hmm. grounds is what makes better sense of which reading. So you've got two manuscripts, two different readings, um, say, uh, and, and you ask a number of questions. One question is, if you've got a reading that is um, like, seems to be problematic, like, you know, you've got, you got a, you've got a verse in Matthew that you have the same verse in Mark, but Matthew's form comes in two different forms. You got one, some manuscripts word it one way, some word it another way. And the ones that word it the other way actually contradict what Mark says, <laughs> okay? And the other agree with Mark says. Mm -hmm. So a scholar asks herself, uh, okay, which is it, which is more likely for a scribe to have done? Is a scribe likely to have created a contradiction with Mark? Or result. Or is a scribe more likely to resolve the contradiction? Well, you know, scribes more likely to resolve the contradiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that means that uh, the reading that harmonizes is less likely original, mm -hmm. which seems backwards, but it's that's how. But it's been proved time and time again that that's right. So you look at that. You look at what what things what which readings would scribes be more likely to create? You look at the ver you look at the wording itself. Does this wording is this wording like this author normally words things? Does it use the vocabulary he normally uses? Does it use the grammar he normally uses? Does it fit within its context or does it not fit in its context? Because the author, you know, is probably going to write like the author. And so if you get verses in there that doesn't sound like the author, that's a suggestion that somebody else wrote them. Mm -hmm. And so what you end up doing is you look at this external evidence, then you look at these kinds of considerations on the internal level. And what you hope is that you get a match that, that the external evidence and the internal evidence agree. And that's when, when that happens, pretty much people say, okay, that's that. What happens generally, though, is that you get different kinds of evidence, different kinds of external, different kinds of internal, and they go different directions. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets interesting for scholars, because then you can make an argument. <laughs> and that's when you write an article <laughs> to argue which way is it based on you know what, what you think is more compelling. Is it then um, helpful to have so many different manuscripts so you can go and check different readings or does that complicate the picture more? Uh, it's it both. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's helpful and it, it creates headaches because if you had, for a lot of texts from the ancient world, we don't have lots of manuscripts. We have a lot of authors from uh, the classical world uh, you know, I mean, just famous, famous authors. I mean, you know, uh, Plato, Homer's got a lot of manuscripts, but Plato and, you know, Euripides or the, the Greek dramatists and things, you, you got, or even like into Latin, so like Cicero and stuff. Some of, sometimes we have a work in only one manuscript. Uh, and there, and what textual criticism does is just try to get rid of things that are obvious mistakes and try to figure out what it originally says, kind of get into highly informed guesswork. But if you've got two manuscripts, <laughs> 
then you know you can compare them and you can decide, well, this one's more likely right or that one's more likely right. Or you could say, you know, they both look wrong. And then you come up with some conjecture about it. Um, but if you've got like, you know, 800 manuscripts of the Gospel of John or whatever, then you say, wow, you got to find them all. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a long time to collate those manuscripts, which means you find all the differences and then to figure out which are which. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier that uh, scribes would change or add to the New Testament based on their own theologies, make things clearer, make things uh, less available to people they would view as heretics. Do you see similar changes um, based on their social concerns and the, the world they were living in? Yeah, this is a this is a big issue. After I wrote the uh, after I wrote my book, uh, the Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, that was just about. A the theological controversies mm -hmm. affecting the text, and specifically controversies over who Christ was um, in the first several centuries. Uh, but then I thought afterwards that uh, I, I would write another book, and I really wanted to, and I didn't get around to it, got on to other things. Um, but it's other some people have written these other books that involve things like, you know, there are all sorts of controversies in early Christianity. It's one of the reasons I just love the study of Christianity, starting with Jesus, but going up, you know, for the first three or 400 years is basically what I do. And I, one of the reasons I love it is because there's just so much controversy. There's obviously controversy with, there's controversies with non-Christians, with pagans, uh, you know, Gentiles who are polytheists. There's controversies with Jews. Mm -hmm. There's controversies with uh, within Christianity that aren't related to theology uh, dire directly. Uh, and so my idea for this next book was going to be, I was going to look at these very social issues where I'd have a chapter, for example, on um, scribes changing the text um, because of their views of women. Uh, scribes, uh, you know, and so like putting, making changes in order, for example, to lower the status of women as it was getting lowered within as Christianity progressed over the centuries. Early on, women had, fairly central role in the early Christian churches, but it wasn't long before their voices got squashed. And uh, and so did that affect scribes who are affecting mm -hmm. the church? Or what about Jewish Christian relationships? You know, Christians are in conflict with Jews and uh, did the anti-Judaism that you find in some Christian circles affect scribes who might've been anti-Jewish? Or, you know, and, and I even got into, interested in stuff like magic. Um, uh, people, people were actually were using biblical manuscripts uh, for as kind of uh, as magical uh, props, <laughs> you know, actually to do that. And so like, did that affect scribes? Did they, did that lead them to change? And so, so I had all these, I was going to give me a chapter in each one. Some of those, some of those things have been written on by other scholars. Um, I have a, a student named, I had a student named Kim Haynes Eitzen, who is now, uh, she's been chair of the religion department at Cornell for a long time. I think maybe she left that position, but she's still at Cornell. But she wrote a book on women and how scribes are altering things with women. And I've got a PhD student now who's writing a book on uh, scribal changes affecting uh, Jewish Christian relations and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm assuming the, the same answer that these changes are incorporated and remain in the New Testament manuscript, well, the New yeah. Testament translations that we use today. Well, let me give you, let me give you one let me give you two examples. Can I do that? Mm, please. <laughs> okay. So let me get the, the one that involves uh, Jewish anti uh, Jewish Christian relationships. I find is very interesting, uh, and it's a, it's a passage that people know if they know much about the Bible. It, when Jesus is being crucified, it, this is only in the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus is being crucified in Luke's Gospel only, he he prays to God. He says, "Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing." Um. That verse is missing from some manuscripts. Interesting. And it's a question: why? Why would a scribe take that out? That's the kind of it, that's the kind of thing I'm really interested. I'm interested not only in what was the original text, of course, I'm interested in that, but also why would somebody take that out? Was it an accident? Like, did they just like skip a line? Did hmm. their eyes skip or something? Uh, or is there something else? And um, what's really interesting is that in early Christianity, that verse was taken to refer to Jesus forgiving Jews for uh, having him crucified. Not He wasn't praying forgiveness for Romans, according to mm -hmm. this early Christian interview, praying for forgiveness for Jews. And so uh, I've written a little bit about this, but I've argued that, you know, why would a scribe want to take those verses out? You don't want Jesus praying for forgiveness for Jews. God didn't forgive the Jews. 
God mm -hmm. destroyed Jerusalem because what they did to Jesus. He didn't forget. So Jesus obviously is not going to pray for forgiveness and God's not going to ignore his prayer. And so it looks like somebody's taking these verses out, uh, this verse out, in order not to have Christ pray for forgiveness for Jews. And so, whew, uh, that's interesting <laughs> for yeah. me. With the women thing, another one, this one's interesting because um, in this case, it's hard to know whether you can argue that there's any external evidence for it. Uh, so, in for, but it matters for uh, Paul's understanding of women. Uh, as you probably know, Paul is sometimes classified as a real misogynist by um, by people today as being somebody who's really opposed to women. And I, th I think it's a misreading of Paul. I don't think Paul was a misogynist in, in the way that people label him. In part, there are passages that tell women, be quiet in the churches. One of them is in the book of 1 Timothy that claims to be written by Paul, but I don't think Paul wrote it. <laughs> and I'm not alone in that. Most, most critical scholars don't think Paul wrote it. We'll probably have a, uh, yeah. we'll probably have a session on that one. But, but there is a passage in 1 Corinthians that Paul did write. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 and 34, Paul um, tells the women in Corinth to stop talking in church, but to be silent. Uh, and that if they've got any questions, ask their husbands at home. And he tells them, you know, that's not not appropriate for them to be talking. So women are not allowed to speak in church, which is a verse that, of course, gets used to mm -hmm. say you can't have women preachers, you know, or, or let alone priests. <laughs> and so uh, but the thing is, there's very good reason for thinking Paul did not write those two verses. Uh, there are manu all the manuscripts have them verses, but some manuscripts don't put them in the same place. Some manuscripts put them in a different place in 1 Corinthians 14. And so some scholars have argued that uh, what's happening is these started out as a note in a margin uh -huh. by somebody who was like, you know, he, Paul's forbidding some things happening in church. And some scribe also adds, and you know, women be quiet in church. You got any questions? Just add, and puts it as a marginal note. Next scribe comes along, says, oh, my predecessor left those verses out, put them in the, and sticks them back in. And then that manuscript gets copied and all of a sudden they're part of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it would be, it would be, and so there, there are good reasons for thinking that, uh, that that's what happened. Uh, but it would be a, you know, it'd be a scribal error rather than something Paul really wrote. Interesting. Do you, are there um, other instances where notes like that are then incorporated into a manuscript, the, the actual text of the manuscript? There are places where it's suspected. Hmm. Um, it's always very difficult to prove. And so it's a, as uh, you know, the, the thing about doing history, as I've said, I said in our first episode, and I'll probably say it virtually every episode, is that it's about it's about establishing probabilities. What's the most probable explanation for this? And probability would certainly be helped if when you've got like a passage that looks like it's been put in or that some manuscripts actually do put in, it'd be helpful if you also happen to have it in a manuscript that's in a, an earlier manuscript that where it's in the margin. Mm -hmm. But even though we have thousands of manuscripts, we there are tens of thousands of manuscripts, hundreds of thousands we don't have. <laughs> and so we just, we almost never get the smoking gun. That's the problem. Thank you. Um, how were the earliest printed editions of the New Testament put together? Um, you wow. go into that in some detail in in misquoting Jesus, but did uh, did the scholars doing that work rely on like a couple of manuscripts, or did they try and get access to as much as they possibly could? So when so um, as most people know, uh, the um, the printing the printing with movable type was invented by Gutenberg in the 15th century, and the first the first thing he printed was a copy of the uh, Latin Bible. Uh, and so the Gutenberg Bible is a very important book that uh, took several years to print because they, it, was, it was hard to set print back then. So, uh, but, you know, this is happening in Western Europe. And in Western Europe, Latin is the language of the Bible. Um, Greek is for the Easterners. So even though the Bible was really written, nobody in the West reads Greek, basically, mm -hmm. except for really trained classicists. And so, uh, but it, some years later in the early 16th century, scholars realized, you know, the Bible was written in Greek. We need to have, we need to go to read <laughs> we it should, in we Greek. We should probably do that. <laughs> and so um, the the first one who actually had a Bible uh, produced and printed and available to the public 
was a uh, was a classical scholar named Erasmus, whose New Testament came out in 1516. 1516. Um, he was he was racing against the clock because he he was a um, he knew he, he was a he was a Protestant and he knew that Catholics were coming up with their own edition, and he wanted to be the first, and so. Um, he, he was very good at Greek and everything, but he, um, he knew he, he wanted to print you know, a Greek New Testament. How are you supposed to do it? Well, you've got to have some manuscripts, right? He basically had a, a 12th century manuscript that he had access to uh, that for the Gospels. And he, he kind of hunted around and a couple, you know, he got a few manuscripts together. He had to borrow a, a manuscript of the book of Revelation from one of his friends who happened to have a Greek manuscript of Revelation, but it was missing the last page, <laughs> the last six verses. <laughs> and so Erasmus, so he, basically he takes his manuscript and he just did his copy editing notes and gave it to a printer and said, here, print this. And so, and so he did. And, um, it was, um, it was kind of rushed. It was rushed out, as he himself admitted, uh, based on a very late manuscript. We we now have manuscripts that are probably at least a thousand years old. Not full manuscripts, but our earliest fragments go about a thousand years earlier than mm -hmm. that. And we have full manuscripts from the fourth century now. But this one's from the twelfth century. So you know it's late, and it's got a lot of changes from the original text in it that earlier manuscripts don't have. But the thing is, since it was the first one to come out, printers started reprinting it. And everybody then started reprinting. And he made a couple more additions. He made a few corrections here and there. It was a real problem for the end of Revelation. He didn't, as manuscript, didn't have the last six verses. So what he did is he took the Latin version, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, and he translated the Latin into Greek. And he printed that as the ending of Revelation. Like, awesome. He came, up with, he came up with like wording that's not found in any Greek manuscript of Revelation, but you know, it's found. This thing was printed so much that after a century or so, people were calling this thing the Textus Receptus, which is a Latin for meaning the received text. It was the text that everybody thought was the Greek New Testament, including the King James translators. They translated Erasmus's Textus Receptus. Uh, and so that's why the King James has readings in it that scholars today don't think are original because it's ba not based on a very good manuscript tradition. That's really interesting. So as new manuscripts have been uh, discovered, made, made available to scholars and academics, has the New Testament, again, for the translations that people use in churches, has that been updated? Do translators go back and update based on new manuscripts or do they just kind of stick with what they have? What ended up happening is uh, this Textus Receptus was around forever until uh, basically it was around until the 1880s where when two um, English scholars who are two of my uh, personal heroes, uh, John Fenton, Anthony Hort, uh, and uh, Brooke uh, Westcott, Westcott and Hort, uh, they um, they did a new edition of the Greek New Testament that looked at the newer manuscripts. And, and so basically today, uh, there are scholars who are always working on making it better and better. There's not much to make better because it's about, it's about as good as it's ever going to give, mm -hmm. given our manuscripts. But translators today who produce a new translation or a new revision of the translation follow the new Greek versions that are available. The only exception is we have some uh, translators that insist that the King James was closest to the original, and so they might update the King James. So you have the new King James Bible which doesn't really change the uh, manuscript basis. It, it updates the language a little bit. Mm -hmm. But other translations, the NIV, the NRSV, the whatever, I mean, just, you know, the English, New English, they're, they're all based on modern scholarship of the manuscripts. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question before we go to our break. Um, if you could pick just one book of the New Testament that you would most like to have the autograph, the original manuscript of, what would it be and why? And do you think the discovery of autographs would influence or change biblical studies? Um, so um, I'll answer the second one first, uh, because it's easy to answer. Do I think having autographs would change? I don't know, but I sure would love to find out. <laughs> because we don't know what was in them. You know, and so and we think we're pretty close. And I think even those of us who talk about, you know, the 
the hundreds of thousands of differences in the manuscripts, almost all of us think that basically we have a pretty good idea what Mark wrote. Uh, you know, there are places where we're going to disagree. We're going to disagree about the sweating blood. We're going to, there are, there are hundreds of places we're going to disagree, but, but you know, basically we think we've got the idea pretty, pretty down pretty well, and maybe we'll find a manager. So I've, it's hard for me to answer the first question, mm -hmm. which would I, I would love to have the gospel of John and I'll tell you why. Um, the gospel of John has long been suspected as having gone through various editions when you read the first 18 verses, fantastic beginning. I'm sure we'll have a whole episode on this. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, and then it goes on to saying the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten before the father. This is talking about Christ is the word of God, this preexistent being that becomes human. But the writing style and the theology of these 18 verses it's so different from the rest of the gospel in many ways. In many ways, it's similar. In many ways, it's different. Some scholars have suspected that the original gospel of John didn't, didn't have it, that it was added mm -hmm. as a second edition. And also, the last entire chapter, there's more consensus about this. There's a, a lot of scholars. This might even be a consensus among historical scholars think that chapter 21 was added on that it wasn't originally there. The, the Gospel of John ends, of course, with Jesus being raised from the dead and appearing to his women disciples. But then you have chapter 21, which has a whole nother chapter of Jesus showing up and talking to his followers. But there are very good reasons for thinking it wasn't originally there. So I would love to have the autograph of John yeah, just that, to see. That would be exciting. <laughs> the question is, how do you know it's an autograph? In other <laughs> words, uh, we, we can have a long talk about this. Because even if you found the autograph, there are going to be people, uh, there will be large debates, and it'll be almost impossible to show that this is the autograph. We should definitely talk about that yeah. another time yeah. because that yeah. is an excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we will take a very brief break, uh, but we will be back in a minute with Bart's weekly update. If you're enjoying the Misquoting Jesus podcast, you'd probably like my online courses as well. I've produced a number so far, with multi-lecture courses on the New Testament Gospels and the books of the Pentateuch, standalone lectures on the Christmas story and the earliest Christian views of Jesus, and a six-hour debate on whether Jesus was actually raised from the dead. If you're interested, check them out at bartherman.com. You'll receive a discount on your purchase simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. Are you interested in learning about important academic topics but don't want to go back to school? You need to check out Wondrium, the service that streams university-level courses taught by top scholars who are also skilled communicators. I've done nine courses for them and can tell you, for high-level adult learning, there's really no other game in town. For a free trial, go to barterman.com slash Wondrium. If you decide to subscribe to Wondrium, this podcast will receive a referral fee, but that'll have no effect on the cost of your subscription, and you'll be supporting our show. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. So, but what is happening in your world professionally and with courses and all the exciting things? Yeah, well, um, uh, so I've got an exciting thing going on with a course that I'm doing. So, so, some people listening to this might know that I've, I've started doing online courses um, that are available on my my personal website, bartermann.com, and these are these are courses that you can you can uh, purchase and, and listen to. They, uh, I've done a course called the Unknown Gospels, for example, and the Unknown Gospels in this course are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> and so, but I'm doing a new course now, and one of my real interests that I've had since I was 17 years old is not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And so I've done a course on Genesis for my, uh, as one of my courses, a six lecture course just on the book of Genesis, explaining again what scholars say about it, why they say it. And that was so much fun. But now I'm doing another course that's just as much fun uh, that's going to be out um, 
we're going to publish this course. Uh, well, I'm going to do it live, actually. So if anybody's listening to this before <laughs> it goes live, <laughs> I'm going to be doing this course live on November 12th and 13th. And whether you hear this before or after that, anyone can purchase the course after. Um, you know, because the whole thing is to, to have these courses available off my website. So this course is on uh, the rest of the Pentateuch, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I'm calling it Finding Moses. <laughs> and so the issue, there are lots of really interesting issues. <clears throat> one is kind of the obvious one. Was there really a Moses? Did he exist? And if he did exist, what can we say about him? But there's also issues like, did the Exodus happen? And if so, is there archaeological evidence for it? If so, is there do ancient people talk about it, <laughs> uh, or is it just the Bible? If it's just the Bible, could it have? And what about the Jewish law? Most of the Pentateuch's filled up with the law. What's that law all about? I mean, you know, are Jews these legalists who think you got to like if you don't obey God, He's going to send you to hell? You know, you break the Ten Commandments, forget it. I mean, what what is the law? And so this this, this is an eight lecture course on uh, that's called Finding Moses. And so I've, I'm really pumped about this because I was just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on it now and coming up with the lectures and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I can tell it sounds really exciting. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of like getting access to a university level education without having to pay for university level fees. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so no, highly it, recommended. This is, this is the kind of thing you would get in a university and it's, uh, and so, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the idea. Make it, make it available to, to people who aren't scholar. You know, so it's not just available to scholarly nerds like you and me, but it's just to, like, to, to regular nerds. I was about to object to being called a nerd, but I really can't. That would be very dishonest. I, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> Oh, but wonderful. The thing is, the thing is lay, lay people are really interested in this stuff. And sometimes they get interested without knowing they're going to be interested. Because mm -hmm. you hear about it, they say, whoa, I didn't know that. And so, no, uh, yeah, so it's, it's that kind of course. It's, it's the, one of the funny things I find about academia is this um, we tell each other that no one is interested in our own little branch of, of esoteric no knowledge. But then you get out on YouTube, you start podcasting, you start doing online lecture series. And actually, most people are interested in your small corner. Uh, yeah. of ancient history. So, yes. I think the problem is that I think a lot of I like a lot of scholars have never learned uh, how to talk to a normal human being about what they do. <laughs> yes. They can talk about they can talk about football or they can talk about what they're going to do at the store. They or they but they can't talk about what they do because they well, that's too complicated. No, it's not. <laughs> Just try to figure out how to communicate. <laughs> so, Just use so the right words. This, yeah. That's what this podcast is about. You know, how do you communicate with normal people about things that are that actually are fairly complicated? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Now it's time for questions from listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by Misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash Ask Bart. But we have some questions from our listeners this week. And we've asked people for just questions about um, misquoting Jesus. If they read the book and they have questions for you, this is the forum to send them to. Um, so without further ado, how common was dictation in the days of Jesus and his disciples? Ah, that's that's a question that's very important and interesting and complicated. I'll give you the short story. Uh, dictation was very common um, for people who wanted to write something like a book, but uh, were not did not have lit writing literacy, uh, and so, uh, or um, more commonly, uh, th that that kind of thing happened on occasion. What more commonly happened is people who did have writing literacy didn't want to go to the trouble of writing things. By writing literacy, I mean that you know you know how to write, um, and so typically, what would happen is if you were like a, an elite person with an education, and you wanted to. Um, you wanted to write something like your Cicero and you want your secretary to write a letter, you dictate it to him. Paul dictated his letters. We have good evidence for that in the New Testament itself that Paul dictated his letters. Uh, and so people writing books would often dictate and the scribe would write it down. The thing is when they dictated, the scribe wrote down what the person dictated. Many people have the mistaken understanding that like it'd be kind of like today. I say, yeah, Megan, I'm thinking about writing an article about, uh, you know, about women in early Christianity. And so here's what I like to say. Would you come up with that for me? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's not dictation. <laughs> dictation is when I say, OK, write these words down. So that did happen. 
in the ancient world. It did not happen outside of educated circles. So Jesus would not have had somebody to dictate to uh, or the disciples. Uh, so it, 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 it did happen and it did affect the New Testament, but it, you can't explain, you know, a lot of historical Jesus stuff with it. This is a, a just a personal follow up question from that. Would the people writing have been um, slaves trained in reading and writing or would they have been professional scribes? Well, this is a great question for uh, a number of reasons. And we may want to have an episode on slaves at some times because slavery in the ancient world was a very real uh, mm. and in some ways dis uh, disturbing phenomenon. But it was very different from what we think of as slavery because of our experience uh, in the West, especially in, Amer in the Americas. Uh, the, the phenomenon in Rome, the Roman world is very different. One difference was slaves were trained and educated and sometimes were high, upper, kind of, I mean, they, they had high status. Mm -hmm. And some were, some were philosophers and some were tutors and some were, and some were scribes. And so sometimes you did have scribes who would copy. You also had people who were professional scribes who were, were free, they weren't slaves, but they made a living off of it. Uh, and so especially that was prominent less in literary circles than um, in legal circles, because, you know, you've got to have a land deed or you've got to need a marriage certificate or a divorce certificate or you need an inherit a will drawn up. You can't write. And so you get, you know, you got that's the guy who the lawyer is the guy who can write. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, second question. Um, are there any particular difficulties in translating the world the word Paul uses to maybe condemn homosexuality. Ah, oh <laughs> okay, we're coming with great ideas for episodes here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the word translated uh, in some Bibles as homosexuality um, is a uh, word that Paul may have made up. The word is arsenokoites. Um, it doesn't occur before Paul. Uh, it's found in 1 Corinthians 6. It shows up a couple times in Paul's letters. Uh, where Paul says that uh, arsenokoitai will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Um, it's a word that is made up of two Greek words, one of which means male, an adult male, and the other is a word that mean is the word we get coitus from, having having sex. So it's that, so the word has something to do with males having sex, but it doesn't say what. <laughs> It doesn't say what. No more details than that. <laughs> and so, and so, it does, so people think, well, it must mean males having sex with males. And it, it, yeah, it might mean that. Some people think it means male prostitutes, for example. Or some people, you know, so there are actually, there are large, there are some, some, some people pointed out that this term, when it does start occurring in Christian texts after Paul, it's used in economic contexts. And so, yeah, you know, and so somebody getting paid for it. And, and mm -hmm. so there, anyway, we don't, we don't exactly know what it means, but homosexual is not the right word, not the right word. It is completely the wrong. The reason it's wrong isn't just because Paul made up this word. We're not quite sure what he meant by it. The reason it's the wrong word is because in English today, when we talk about homosexuality, we are talking about our general idea is that some people have a variety have different orientations mm -hmm. and different people have different ideas about this, even though there's a pretty good consensus among, but among scientists and so, but, but, so people do, but people do have different, some people are inclined towards people of their own sex and some are the opposite. And if somebody's inclined to their own sex and has sex with people of their own sex, because of this inclination, that orientation, they are homosexual in the ancient world. They never had a concept of orientation. This is a post Freudian, understanding that is so commonplace in our heads, we think it's just natural. Of course, people mm -hmm. have orientation. So in the age world, people had same-sex relations as much as people do today. Um, and people had what we would consider to be inclination, but they didn't, they didn't think in terms of sexuality. Mm -hmm. They didn't think in, so Paul's not condemning an orientation or acting out an orientation because he doesn't know people have orientations. Mm -hmm. And so homosexual is just completely the wrong world, word for it. Interesting. Thank you. I had absolutely no idea about any of that. Um, <laughs> we... Welcome to my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's great. I learned something. The audience learned something. It's perfect. Um, okay, one more audience question, and then we will uh, we will do our summary for the day. Uh, would you have become an agnostic if you had not become a biblical scholar? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, um, I uh, I don't know what I would become if I had not become a biblical scholar. I I had like nobody in the world thought I'd become a scholar, <laughs> period. Let alone a biblical scholar. So I don't know what would have happened to me generally. 
the reason I became an agnostic is a long story. That's probably another thing, but it's not because of my biblical scholarship, mm -hmm. as I said in my, our last thing. It, um, the short answer, which I know I'm going to get a lot of email now, so I probably shouldn't say it, but the, but the, the, the short answer is I left, I left off believing in God because I came to a point where I could no longer believe that there was a, a powerful and loving God who was in control of the world who answers prayer, who intervenes when people are in need and is in any way active. Uh, and I came to that view, not because of the Bible, but because of my uh, recognition of the amount of horrible, horrible suffering that is ongoing in our world. And people praying, praying that God will do something and nothing happens. And just the horrible suffering made me, and I, you know, I, I know what the Bible says about it. I wrote I wrote a book about what the Bible says about it that we'll probably deal with at one point. And I know what philosophers say. I know what religious scholars say. I know what preachers say. I know what, even, I know what they all say. I just got to a point where I didn't believe it anymore. Mm -hmm. Would I have gotten to that point if I weren't a biblical scholar? Okay, my guess is I probably would have. I, I would guess so because I think it's part of my innate nature to be concerned for people who are suffering. And at some point, I think I would have just said, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for sharing. And audience, excellent questions. Thank you for submitting them. Um, if you have a question you would like Bart to answer during our next listeners' questions, please submit it at www.bartermancom forward slash ask Bart. Uh, Bart, before we wrap up, do you want to give a quick summary of what we've talked about today? Yeah, well, so this is uh, this is for me. This is this is fundamental stuff. This is what I most got interested in when I first learned about the Bible. What, do we know what the words are? <laughs> uh, we've got these thousands of manuscripts, and but we've got hundreds of thousands of differences in the manuscript. And sometimes, most of the time, these differences don't matter for anything. But sometimes they affect how we understand the Bible. I mean, the one thing we didn't get into is the only passage in the New Testament that explicitly says that there are three divine beings who are one is in two verses that were in this edition that Eras that <laughs> they're in the Texas Recaptus, and uh, they weren't originally there. And so that might matter. I'm not saying that you wouldn't believe in the Trinity now, but there are passages that really are affected by which words there are, and scholars have to figure it out, and it's not easy. I have friends who have spent 40 years working on this stuff, uh, and they can't agree among themselves uh, about, and they're complete experts. And so... It's pretty important to if you want to it's 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 important for many people to know what the the what the Bible teaches. But you can't know what the Bible teaches if you don't know what the Bible's words were. And so this is a very important topic in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, audience, thank you also for joining us today for the second part of our very first episode. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure for both of us and hopefully you enjoyed it too. If you did, remember to subscribe um, to the podcast to make sure you catch all future episodes. And again, if you have questions for Bart, submit them at www.bartermancom forward slash ask Bart. Uh, and if you are interested also in the courses that Bart was talking about earlier, you can visit bartermancom and use the code MJPODCAST for a special discount on all of the courses. Uh, Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk about how we got the New Testament. You get these 27 books. Why did we get those? What about the others? I mean, there were other gospels written and epistles and acts and Revel uh, who decided? <laughs> when did they decide? I mean, whoa, uh, that's a big one. And so that's 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 one that I think a lot of people ask these days. And so I'm really, really eager to talk about it with you. You and me both. Thank you so much. Thank you, audience. Uh, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.